Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening. I'm Mike Sprague. I'm the director of the Polar Institute at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's program, Gender Equality in the Arctic, Phase 3 Report Launch. As an area of emphasis for Iceland, gender equality was included as one of the priority issues of the Arctic Council Chairmanship Program. Gender Equality in the Arctic, or GEA, dating back to 2013, is an international collaborative project intended to raise visibility and understanding of diverse gender topics in the region. A major component of gender equality in the Arctic Phase 3, launched in 2019, has been the development of a pan-Arctic report to identify priorities and actions to increase diversity and gender balance in policy and decision-making processes. The Polar Institute is pleased to host this report launch entitled Pan-Arctic Report on Gender Equality in the Arctic. And we're doing so with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Iceland, the Icelandic Arctic Council Chairmanship, the Icelandic Arctic Cooperation Network, the Stephenson Arctic Institute, the Directorate of Equality in Iceland, and the Institute of Arctic Studies at Dartmouth, and my friend and colleague, Dr. Ross, Virginia. Let me take one moment to recognize the extraordinary leadership of the government of Iceland. Foreign Minister Thorsson, Ambassador Einar Gunnarsson, who is chair of the senior Arctic officials, Mr. Magnus Johannesson, Special Advisor for Arctic Affairs, and Mr. Frederick Jansson, Iceland's senior Arctic official, and the entire Icelandic team for their efforts over the last two years. They have successfully navigated with colleagues from each of the Arctic eight nations, the challenges and stark realities of a global pandemic. And they've done so to maintain and elevate the critical work of the council. And finally, on behalf of the scholars and the staff of the Polar Institute, I want to say that it's been an honor to support the Icelandic chairmanship. Over the last 24 months, we've conducted 10 programs and published a report with the cooperation of the Icelandic government. Many of those programs were in partnership with our colleagues at the Kennedy School at Harvard University and their Arctic Initiative, and today with our colleagues at Dartmouth's Arctic Studies Program. It's now a pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Gudegren Thor Thordensen, Minister for Foreign Affairs and International Development Cooperation of Iceland and Chair of the Arctic Council. So welcome to all. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. It is my pleasure to be here today to launch the Pan-Arctic Report on Gender Equality in the Arctic, which the GEO project has been working on. I want to thank the Polar Institute and Wilson Center for hosting this event, um, as well as the Ministry for Foreign Affairs in Iceland, the Institute for Arctic Studies at Dartmouth and the Stefansson Arctic Institute, and the Directorate for Equality. I will begin with a brief introduction. Um, we will then move couple of presentations of two of the report chapters, followed by a panel. I will kick off with a couple of questions to the panelists, and then we will open the floor to questions and comments from the audience. If the audience could please send their questions or comments via email to polar at wilsoncenter.org. If, um, if you guys could share my slides, please. Excellent. Could you go to my first slide? Thank you. The report is an Arctic Council chairmanship project under the theme of people and communities in the Arctic under the Sustainable Development Working Group. Leads and co-leads include Iceland, Sweden, Finland, Canada, the United States, the Sami Council and the Aleut International Association. But as it is a highly collaborative project, it includes many other additional partners of which you see a list on the slide. Could you please go to, my, to the next slide? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the project is led by the Icelandic Arctic Cooperation Network. And while the report is published by the chairmanship and the SWD with the Icelandic Arctic Cooperation Network, the Icelandic Directorate for Equality and the Stefansson Arctic Institute, it is done so in collaboration with all our partners and sponsors. Next slide, please. A vital component of the work has been this collaborative dynamic and the engagement process. 
We made significant efforts to ensure inclusion and transparency during the process by actively soliciting feedback from peers and interested parties. In addition to our project partners and indigenous experts, we established an editorial committee and a youth advisory group. The project partners, the editorial committee, and the SDWG's social, economic, and cultural expert group and the youth advisory group were instrumental in providing ideas, knowledge, and support in developing themes for the report. Further, the inclusion of permanent participants and other indigenous experts was a vital component of the engagement process. And through our discussions and with their guidance, we inched closer to better understanding indigenous perspectives on gender and related issues. We have 10 lead authors of the thematic chapters and we're blessed with a team of seriously committed people who reached out to and coordinated the work of approximately 80 contributing authors from some 15 to 20 countries, including all Arctic states. There was a particularly strong uh, number of contributions from Canada, Greenland, Iceland and Russia. Significant contributions were also made by Indigenous experts through being project partners on the editorial committee, the youth advisory boards, and through direct contributions to chapters. This included the Sami Council, the Aleut International Association, the Arctic Athabascan Council, as well as the Paktutit Inuit Women of Canada. We held six online and uh, uh, thematic public feedback sessions and integrated this feedback into the chapters. Before the report, the report draft was submitted to the SDWD for review and endorsement, we provided the full draft of the report for review by partners, the EDCOM, the Youth Advisory Group, and had each chapter reviewed by external reviewers, including reviewers identified by the Youth Advisory Group. The draft report was submitted to the SDWG late January 2021 and endorsed by the SDWG in March, followed by endorsement by the senior Arctic officials of the Arctic Council. The report will be submitted to the Arctic Council Ministerial, and we are hoping the sailing there will be smooth. But of course, it is never a good idea to count your chickens before they hatch. If you could go to my next slide, please. During the process, we learned a few lessons. It was a considerable time pressure on the project. We were ambitious and wanted to deliver a useful document on time. Uh, indigenous and youth perspectives are to some extent reflected in the chapters, but we do recognize that we will have to do even better in future phases of the project if we are to meaningfully include indigenous perspectives and move even further away from token engagement. In the report, we suggest that indigenous and youth perspectives be an integral, integral part from conception to final product, and that resource and funding requirements be built into project proposals and funding applications. A truly meaningful consultation and engagement process requires time and extensive dialogues. It is crucial to make sure there is sufficient time allotted to this, similarly to interdisciplinary projects. Drawing from diverse knowledge systems and weaving together multiple perspectives requires a level of respect and commitment that should not be underestimated or rushed. Next slide, please. The chapter themes we decided to prioritize were law and governance, which examines formal obligations regarding gender equality in the Arctic public governance as expressed in political and legal documents, including special consideration of indigenous peoples. Security, which examines the impacts of inequalities in the Arctic through a security lens and identifies trends in security. The chapter draws from global insights about insecurity that are relevant to the Arctic and identifies challenges and insecurities. Gender and environment provides an overview of the gendered dimensions of issues connected to the broadly understood environment of the Arctic region, including climate, oceans, land, biodiversity, natural resources, and waste and pollution. Migration and mobility discusses how migration and mobility in the Arctic are constructed through gender and why an understanding of migration and mobility requires a gendered approach. 
Indigeneity, gender, violence, and reconciliation seeks to take a step towards mapping the complex relations amongst violence, gender, the social, economic, political, and legal systems, human health and well being, culture, and identities in the Arctic. Empowerment and faith control seeks to identify concrete strategies for political, economic, and civic gender empowerment to facilitate sustainable policymaking for the Arctic. We are extremely grateful for all the support received from various funding sources. These include support for chapters from the MFAs of Sweden, Norway, and Finland, the government of the Faroe Islands, more specifically the Ministry of Culture and Foreign Affairs, the Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs Canada, and the National Science Foundation and US Department. Additionally, support was provided to the project by the Nordic Council of Ministers, the MFA Iceland, the Icelandic Gender Equality Fund, the Prime Minister's Office in Iceland, the Directorate of Equality, and the Stefansson Arctic Institute. Without this support, we would not have been able to pull this off. We see this commitment to the project as reflecting an understanding of the importance of gender in the Arctic region and its sustainable development. Next slide, please. The report provides almost 70 policy relevant highlights, which can be found with each chapter and in the executive summary. Most prominent were the need for mainstreaming and gender based analysis, better gender and sex disaggregated data, inclusive terminologies, and intersectionality. The highlights are relevant for multiple audiences, including Arctic states, the Arctic Council and its working groups, policymakers, private industry, the research community, and the public. This slide indicates the category under which policy highlights were included. As you will see from the report, when you read it, there is still considerable work ahead in reducing inequalities, not only in terms of gender, but in a broader understanding of systemic and persistent inequalities, for instance, in terms of indigenous and non-indigenous populations. Next slide, please. Three recommendations are provided specifically for the Arctic Council. The first of these is related to gender mainstreaming, where it is recommended the Arctic Council systematically engages with and mainstreams gender-based analysis across its work setting an example at national and regional levels. The second relates to the data challenges we encountered in all chapters. Here we recommend the Council encourage and facilitate the development of guidelines for consistent and comparable data throughout the Arctic. The final recommendation relates to the need to further analyze, refine, prioritize and operationalize policy relevant highlights it really is suggesting that the phase four of the GEO project includes support for implementation of these recommendations. Next slide. Our next steps are broadly speaking, dissemination, where we are looking at various avenues for dissemination of findings from the report and related topics. This will be done in collaboration with all our partners and colleagues. We really really do not want this work to find its way into a dusty drawer, never to be seen again. The work is just beginning and we have already begun discussing the next phase of the project. We have a few spin-offs already in the making. We want to publish extended versions of the chapter on law and governance and migration and mobility, as we still have significant material we would like to make sure is accessible. This will be available online later in the year. There's also a book on empowerment under development spearheaded by Maria and Andre, who you will hear from later. We are working with Gunnild on applying for funding for a project on gender and security, et cetera, et cetera. We have begun preparations for GEO4. We've already had a couple of meetings with our partners and colleagues. A lot of ideas are circulating and we really could go into a million directions. Our luxury challenge will be to prioritize and find an approach we're all comfortable with. And I, for one, am looking forward to the road ahead. Next slide, please. 
I want to thank all of those involved, um, our partners, the editorial committee, the youth advisory group, and of course our various sponsors and co-sponsors for all the support and advice along this journey. Thank you to our lead authors and contributing authors, our designer Jonas and the photographers, Nordregio for their maps and data support, the SACEC and the SDWG, and Executive Secretary Jennifer Spence for showing us the way through the Arctic Council process. We would have been entirely lost without you. I want to thank the research assistants and the GEO team for endless hours and support. Especially, I want to thank Kjasti Omar, our project manager, who tirelessly plowed with me through long days and weekends with persistence, patience, and positivity. To our Indigenous colleagues, thank you for the support, your contributions to this report and the process. Thank you, Bridget, for our hours of chatting and guidance provided. Last but not least, I would like to thank the Icelandic Chairmanship team and Minister Guðlaugur for their continued support of and believe in the project and gender equality. Without all these great folks, this report would not have seen the light of day. And then my last slide, please. I could go on and on about the report all day. It is very close to our hearts, but we do not really have the time or really the patience. Um, I will point you to the project webpage, which includes a specific page for the report. And you can find all relevant information on that, including information on all those involved in the making of it. The report and the executive summary will be available for download after the ministerial meeting on the 21st of May. That concludes my introduction to the report. Um, checking in to technology te tech experts, where are with the minister's address? Should I keep going or do you wanna, I keep going? Okay. Listen. Okay. And, and, and Embla, just, just sorry to, to interrupt. Yeah, they're, they're working on it. And as okay. soon as we go, I, I'll come back in and, and we'll find a right time in the presentation okay, to insert those, okay? Brilliant. Thank you, Mike. So if we now move on to our presenters, we have an excellent group of folks with us here today. Uh, I wanna first introduce Maria Rosanova, Smith and Andrei Petrov, who will tell us about the chapter on empowerment and fate control. Maria and Andre, the floor is yours. Thank you, Emla, and hello to everyone around the world. Uh, let me try to share my screen. One second. All right, so as one of the lead authors of the empowerment chapter, it is a great pleasure and honor for me to be here today and present key themes and findings from our truly collaborative work. And I would like to take the opportunity to say thank you once again to all co-authors, our research assistants, and all GIA team, and especially to our team lead, Embla Otzudetzir, and last but not least, National Science Foundation for support, and of course, Woody Wilson Center and Polar Institute for hosting us here today. Um, so uh, despite an increased interest in gender studies in general, the Arctic regions and the topic of gender empowerment have been mostly overlooked. And this study was designed to address some of the existing knowledge gaps. In our research, uh, broadly, we broadly define gender empowerment as opportunities for equal and meaningful participation in decision-making and responsibility sharing in all spheres and at all levels. In our chapter, we identified three spheres where uh, gender empowerment is key to community sustainability and resilience. These are political, economic, and often completely overlooked civic sphere. And working on our chapter, we realized that before we move forward, we really needed to know where we were at. And this is how we came to an idea to develop a new system of indicators of gender empowerment designed specifically for the Arctic. 
And unlike many other gender indexes, our indicators are focused specifically on regional and local community levels. So I will start with key findings in political empowerment. Uh, based on these indicators, we identified key patterns and mega trends of gender empowerment across the Arctic regions and communities. One of them is persistent gender gaps in Arctic government institutions. These gaps are observed in respect to both numeric representation and access to top leadership position at all levels of Arctic government institutions. An indicator of women representation in elective regional and city bodies demonstrates that except for Chukotka region in Russia and Nordic regions of Bothernborten and Norderborten in Sweden and Nordland in Norway, women remain less likely to participate in the political sphere than men. We also found that higher political stakes correspond to greater gender gaps in most circumpolar jurisdictions. Another finding is continual patterns of vertical and horizontal gender related clustering in government institutions. They clearly reflect remaining stereotypes of gender roles and traditional gender domains still prevailing in the Arctic. For example, vertical uh, gender clustering or so called glass ceilings appear in form that Arctic women are less likely to be at the top of leadership hierarchies, while horizontal segregation or so-called glass walls, they still remain very profound. Arctic women are less likely to have access to spheres of politics and governance where the stakes are high, for example, extractive industries, infrastructure, transportation, fisheries, militaries, and many others. And at the same time, women are often all outnumbered in less prestigious, less lucrative segments of public governance that are traditionally perceived as a female domain of politics. For instance, uh, social services, family services, gender equality issues, school education, and many, many others. Uh, despite existing challenges, there are two important and very positive megatrends that we also identified in the Arctic uh, regions. So the first one is mainstreaming gender equality and empowerment in their government institutions and practices in many Arctic countries. And the second one is, uh, not the last one, uh, is re-emerging indigenous concepts of gender and very important responsibility in political empowerment. So now I would like to give a floor to my colleague author, uh, Professor Andrei Petrov, director of the Arctic Center at the University of Northern Iowa, who will share the results of our research on economic empowerment and policy relevant highlights. Andrei, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you, Maria, if you could advance the slide. So um, and other two spheres uh, that we discussed, so economic um, is very important, of course. And there is a, a variety of findings that we were able to identify, but just a few of the most important ones. First of all, we're witnessing the feminization, if you could call it this way, of human capital. Essentially, women as a group in the Arctic are now more educated, have higher levels of education than men as a group. And that's prevalent in most of jurisdictions. So there is an actually the gender uh, gap in education is there and it's likely to grow further. So that's um, um, very interesting. So we've seen changes in, in human capital labor force now and in the future so that the women would be playing even more important role. At the same time, unfortunately, though, we see prevalent gender-based occupational clustering and segregation, just like as Mari described for political sphere, we still see um, uh, you know, lack lack of women as leaders in businesses and management positions. There's still glass ceilings and glass walls and not all occupational spheres are available to women or it's difficult to advance uh, careers in, in, in a variety of uh, sectors where traditionally it's, there's a perception that is not necessarily uh, something appropriate for, 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 for female workers, for instance. So there's Again, the trend is that it's diminishing, but still there is a prevailing gender-based clustering and segregation. At the same time, we do see the transforming roles of uh, tr transforming roles of different genders in the economy. 
and the growing role of um, of women again as a part of a labor force and also uh, a trend that um, will percolate in the future as we ex expect as women become more educated and more active on the labor in the labor force next slide please um, in addition to that, uh, we still see, though, the persistent wage, wealth, and entrepreneurship gaps uh, with gender. So still, most of the um, areas uh, where uh, lucrative areas, so high-paid jobs, or, or even in the same uh, positions, uh, women are still earning less on average than, than men. I mean, there are some regions where that's not the case, and there are particular uh, communities and and sectors where this is not true anymore. But it's still in many cases, and most of the jurisdictions we see, as you see in the map to the right, you see that pattern repeating itself. And it's still, and still an issue to tackle. At the same time, we do see some, uh, some interesting advancements. For example, indigenous women actively participating in mixed economy, playing an increasing role in their communities and in leadership and management which is, of course, um, a, an interesting trend that we hope will continue in the future. At the same time, we also see an, an increasing fragmentation of empowerment among genders based on variety of characteristics that go along with, with uh, gender characteristics so that it becomes a more uh, fractured, kind of diverse field. And in some sectors and some um, occupations, we see positive trends and others are more stagnant and uh, the, um, the sort of the equality there is not as uh, uh, increasing, not as rapidly as in other uh, places or in other professions or occupational spheres. So we see kind of some fracturing. So now I go with the policy relevant highlights. So first of all, uh, we as uh, assert that Arctic is a diverse place. There is no one size fits all for policy in respect to um, gender um, empowerment. Cultural, political, economic, and diverse Arctic regions require different approaches to improve gender empowerment and overcome gender equality gaps. All genders empowerment is key to community sustainability, resilience, and maybe most importantly, thrivability, the ability of community to thrive now and in the future. To ensure that, we believe that more efforts are necessary at the circumpolar, national, regional, and local levels to ensure gender empowerment. And truly inclusive approach to gender is also important that it includes all genders, all groups that attain equality at the end of the process. Moving gender empowerment from the periphery to the center of public policy discourse and decision-making is vital for achieving sustainable development goals in the Arctic. We need to all realize that and implement that approach, which means maintaining focus on gender empowerment and relevant research, improving gender specific data collection and availability, and integrating gender empowerment in sustainable development efforts all across the Arctic. Next slide. Continuing and increasing our focus on mainstreaming gender empowerment, which will include st establishing a system of monitoring based on gender empowerment indicators in the Arctic. Mainstreaming gender into policies, programs, and political processes all across the spectrum creating or strengthening existing gender equality institutions and practice in Arctic jurisdictions, prioritizing gender-oriented affirmative action policies as well. Underrepresented gender's access to and participation in political, economic, and civil spheres still needs to be improved. In some Arctic communities, a particular focus should be placed on men and, and their empowerment and individual faith control. That's very important that in this discussion we have that as an, another focus where it's appropriate. And of course, most importantly, indigenous people's tradition and perspective on gender roles and gender equality should be acknowledged and incorporated in theoretical and practical frameworks of gender knowledge building and in our policies as well in, at the local, national and circumpolar polar levels. Thank you. Excellent, Maria and Andre. Thank you very much. Um, I'm told that the video is ready, but I thought it might just be easier if I go on to the next presentation and then we'll try again um, the video before we start with the panelists. So Gose and Tani, are you ready to go? Yes, ready. Gosha, if you have the presentation. Perfect. Hello, everybody. Um, 
Welcome to this uh, launch event and thank you to the organizers of uh, the Wilson Center and of course the GIA team that has supported all of us. Um, my name is Tani Pryor and together with my co-author Gosha Smiaszek, we're the co-leads of Women of the Arctic, a nonprofit association based in Rovaniemi, Finland. And over the next 10 minutes, we'll, we'll spend some time sharing insights from our chapter on gender and environment, which was written with contributions, including new and original research from a long list of, of authors, which are, should be on your screen right now, and which was funded by Finland's Ministry for Foreign Affairs. So we're very grateful to everybody on this list. So to begin with, um, first of all, why the theme of gender and environment? And the principal reason for inclusion of this chapter in, in the report on gender equality in the Arctic actually goes to the core of the mandate of the Arctic Council, which of course um, is based on two, two pillars, one of them being sustainable development and another and being environmental protection. And of course, as many persons uh, know very well, the work of the Arctic Council of its all of all of its working groups um, revolves very much around the questions of environment. But not only not only that, envir environment and environmental protection is also a tenet, one of the main elements in achieving sustainable development in the region. Not only that, um, but the natural environment is, of course, also central to lives and livelihoods of people in the Arctic. And here we mean it not only in economic terms or um, concerning subsistence activities, but it's also extremely important to people's health and well-being, both physical, mental, but, but also emotional and spiritual. Of course, we all know very well that because of climate change, environment in the Arctic is changing very rapidly. And its pace and the pace of this change is accelerating. And what follows with, um, with climate change is also, um, are also economic developments that we, are, that we are facing in the region. So of course, we are all very well aware of expansion of um, usage of natural resources and discussions about prospects of further exploitation um, of them in the region. But apart from that, one other factor that um, pushed us to work on, on this chapter has been actually over the last five years, um, the engagement, the increasing engagement of global frameworks um, with the theme of gender and, and environment. So of course, starting from sustainable development goals adopted in 2015, where gender equality is one, uh, one of the goals, goal, goal number five, all the major international environmental conventions, such as Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants, UNFCCC, work of Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, Minamata Convention on Mercury, all the instruments with which the Arctic Council has been engaging very actively over the last five years, they actually stepped up very significantly their work with gender equality and their provisions related to gender. And here you can just see um, a very few um, reports from a much larger number that was published in, in the last few years, starting from work of UNEP, the first global gender and environment outlook, um, but also others. All of them provided the background and inspiration for, for work included in this chapter. So given the mandate of the Arctic Council and accounting for the central importance of gender equality and gender related issues in the effective realization of this mandate, our chapter really sought to provide a synthesis of existing research, not necessarily new and original research, but this in itself is, is quite a, a remarkable contribution um, as it has not necessarily been done before. And so our aim was really to highlight some of the central dimensions of the gender environment nexus in an Arctic context and to support a more systematic engagement with gender related matters in the Arctic Council, which has a strong environmental focus. And this type of engagement and the application of a gender lens to the work of the council also aim to deepen our comprehension of various trends in the region while supporting the advancement of more tailored actions, plans, policies, as well as more equitable and inclusive forms of sustainability. Next slide, please. Perfect. Um, so the scope of this chapter and its primary focus on environment, of course, covers a multitude of issue areas 
Um, and given both the size and diversity of Arctic countries, their subregions, individual communities, we also recognize that an adequate and an in-depth treatment of the gender dimensions of these issues in the Arctic would actually necessitate separate chapters, separate projects, um, separate reports for each individual topics. Of course, we couldn't cover all of this. So really we wanted to present um, not an in-depth coverage, nor a systematic comparison of different parts of the Arctic, but instead to highlight recent and leading issues at the intersection of gender and environment in the Arctic through very illustrative cases in areas and sectors and where they're, they're most uh, prominent or most relevant at this time. The chapter also identified various areas for future research and inquiry. And the key areas that we focused on were major international frameworks and environmental conventions applicable to the Arctic, which have engaged with gender equality and gender issues to date. We've also examined the gendered nature of climate change in the Arctic, including the effects of climate change and environmental change, links between gender and adaptation efforts, the complex yet intricate relationship between climate and environmental change and human health and well-being, as Gosha mentioned, and we also looked at the management of natural resources from land to sea. So everything from forestry, mining, renewable energy, fisheries and aquaculture. And given the vital importance of natu natural resources to the livelihoods of all Arctic peoples, both in terms of subsistence and economic prospects and a steadily increasing interest in their exploitation, um, the discussion is quite important and timely and central to most debates on sustainable development in the region. And last but not least, we focused on different facets and gender dimensions to pollution, including persistent organic pollutants, mercury, waste, plastics pollution. Thank you. So, um... Moving to some of the key findings, and um, as Embla already mentioned in, in the first presentation, I mean, some of the findings we have been finding consistently across all the chapters and in our work and discussions um, with authors of, of the other parts of the report. But one of the things that we have been finding consistently across all the central teams and sectors that, that you have just seen on the previous slide was how significant are gaps in our knowledge on gender environment nexus when it comes to when it comes to those teams in the Arctic. So just to use, for example, um, the most obvious and by far the most research topic in the Arctic being climate change, it is actually quite striking to see how few studies um, actively engage and adopt gender lens in, in their approaches. For instance, um, Gender is largely invisible in studies of climate change. Um, there is very little consideration also of different observations of environmental change that women and men bring, bring to the table. This has been confirmed um, by, by other studies and it concerns both indigenous observations, but also those coming from, from other inhabitants in the region. Very little is said about gender um, in the context of adaptation to climate change in the Arctic, which we have, uh, which we have found as another quite striking finding given how much discussion about the need for adaptation and enhancing resilience is now, is now happening in the region. Of course, all of this actually follows from lack of sexes and gender disaggregated data. Um, so what we have seen that, first of all, what we have is that our knowledge is mostly based on individual case studies rather than long-term projects, long-term monitoring. Um, and when Andre and Maria already mentioned, um, developing of indicators that would be really, that would really matter um, and be relevant to, to the whole region. But next to a question of dearth of data, there is also the point that many of the sectors that we have looked at in the Arctic, they are traditionally considered um, as being male dominated. And the point is that reliance on, on this very often outdated data does not help us to account for a very multifaceted nature of women's contribution to those sectors, as well as how consequences of those developments of those sectors differently um, impact different groups in the, in the societies. So on the one hand, we have lack of data and oftentimes um, the outdated data that, um, that uses, well, 
that helps to that perpetuates um, outdated images of, of gender in the region. But um, just to share one other slide here. Um, so this is part, part of our study that we conducted together with Great Arendal, and it actually focused on gender in Arctic Council reports and assessments. So um, the slide that you, the graph that you see here, it actually it includes the study that, that we conducted of uh, 216 reports of the Arctic Council, where basically we checked how many times um, or that included minimum three times award gender. And as you can see, this study is quite striking, even though it's very simple in, in its terms, it really illustrates how this far engagement with gender and gender equality has not taken place um, in, in, more, um, in more working groups or in more works of, of the Arctic Council. So how could those issues be addressed? So we highlighted, um, we have some policy relevant highlights as well as some recommendations at the end of our, our chapter. And the first one is the expansion of Arctic studies with a specific gender focus, which essentially um, provides that global scholarship on gender and environment has been growing as Gosha mentioned earlier, yet its primary focus has been on the global south, which limits its applicability to the Arctic. And in fact, we found that the gendered impacts of climate change in places like Nunavut and, and other areas, um, the experiences of indigenous women actually appear to be more relatable to the experiences of men in developing countries as they're reflected in, in some of the more um, large scale reports that are out there. And so our recommendation is that we actually expand our Arctic studies to include a gender focus that also accounts for the particular traits of the Arctic and its characteristics, so that we aren't necessarily focusing on the national and we're not focusing on the global experiences, but we're looking at the Arctic specifically. Our second um, highlight was to encourage gender and sex disaggregated data. And again, to, to go on from Gosha's point, it's the aim of that is really to enhance adaptive capacity within the Arctic and to support policy and decision making through the collection of new data that is gender and sex disaggregated and to provide a specific special focus to given sectors where there's a significant dearth of, of data at this time. And these include fisheries, extractive industries and forestry. Um, and it would really provide insights into um, the multifaceted nature of these industries, as Gosha mentioned. And more specifically, we recommended that decision makers encourage official registers and statistics to provide this type of data, both for researchers and national agencies, business and service providers. And last but not least, um, our recommendation is gender mainstreaming and a stronger focus on intersectionality, as Angela mentioned earlier. The Council should systematically engage with and mainstream gender across its work, and particular attention should be paid to the accounting for and advancing of a greater diversity of gender perspectives regarding environmental observations and monitoring. And beyond gender, the Council should promote the application of an intersectional approach to research and policy development for all environmental issues in the Arctic. And this is paramount in addressing overlapping forms of discrimination based on age, class, ability, ethnicity, gender, nationality, sexuality, and race. More specifically, we recommended that the Arctic Council create a small group comprised of experts and representatives from all working groups and subsidiary bodies to develop a set of guidelines for the systematic inclusion of gender and the application of this intersectional approach into the council. And we also recommended furthermore that funding agencies such as national science foundations and research councils in the Arctic, as well as in non-Arctic states, promote and require gen gender sensitive approaches the collection of gender disaggregated data again, and gender-based analysis as a part of their research calls and programs moving forward. So thank yeah. you. This is yeah, perfect. Excellent, you guys. Thank you, Gosha, and thank you, Tani. Um, so technological wizards, should we give the uh, minister another crack? See if it works. 
let's do let's do that. And, and Trion at the at the broadcast facility there at, at the Wilson Center will will key it up for us. Let's see if this works. Let's see if it works. Okay. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm both excited and honored to be given the opportunity to address you all on the launch of this ambitious report on gender equality in the Arctic. I would like to start by thanking the project partners and the Arctic Council Sustainable Development Working Group, sponsors and especially the many authors who contribute both time and effort to the report. I would like to mention the permanent participants and thank them for their support, cooperation and contribution to the report. However, I cannot go on without thanking specifically Embla Eir Oddsdóttir, director of the Icelandic Arctic Cooperation Network for leading the gender equality in the Arctic project from the beginning in 2013 and for all her hard work and determination to the project. For over a decade, Iceland has been ranked at the top of the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Index. This is something we are proud of and comes with a responsibility to lead by example. In Iceland, we have been fortunate to see valuable progress on this front, which is due to continuous effort that have delivered results. Advancing gender equality has long been an area of importance for Iceland and one which we emphasize both domestically as well as in our foreign policy. We also believe that this fundamental component of sustainable development, not just in the Arctic, but globally. Therefore, it wasn't exactly a coincidence that Iceland initiated a dialogue on gender equality in the Arctic in 2013 and has kept the ball rolling together with a growing number of project partners ever since. We like to believe that GIA has become a household term, at least within the Arctic Council family. This made it an obvious choice for us to include gender equality as one of our priority areas for our chairmanship in the Council, which is coming to an end this month after a two-year term in the driver's seat. As the Arctic gathers more international attention, our region is also going through rapid ecological, social and economic changes. These changes affect the people of the Arctic differently, affect men and women differently, and not only because the Arctic covers a large and geographically diverse area, the need for gender-based analysis and gender mainstreaming are identified throughout this report as a way to promote gender equality. The Arctic Council can lead the way in this regard by continuing to support research and action to improve and promote gender equality in the region. For us to get a better understanding of the issues and inequality often facing individuals both in their everyday lives in the Arctic and across different regions, sectors and genders, we need consistent and comparable data. This is how we can inspire international policymaking as well as bringing attention to the importance of gender equality in the Arctic. The objective of the GIA project has been to raise the visibility and understanding of gender issues in the region, increasing diversity and gender balance in both policy and decision making is important. The project has from the outset been aimed at stringing a network of experts and stakeholders in the field and providing them with a platform to promote and expand dialogue on gender equality in the Arctic. It, is, it also contributes to identify and fill the knowledge gaps in this subject. Gender equality in the Arctic is an ever important issue and one close to our hearts here in Iceland. It is a must for us, political leaders in the region, to do our best to put in place policy measures and legislations to better support the communities in their efforts to make progress when it comes to gender equality. 
Track records show that increased gender equality goes hand in hand with improved social and economic well-being and is therefore of the utmost importance for all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, if there was one thing that we knew with absolute certainty about gender equality in the Arctic before this report, it was that there are huge knowledge gaps to be filled on this topic. The report we are launching here today certainly contributes to strengthen our knowledge base and close some of those gaps, while providing policymakers with the understanding that is needed to foster resilient and thriving communities in the Arctic. I take this opportunity to congratulate all of you who contribute to this impressive an important report. Many of you have participated in the GIA project throughout its three phases. It will be exciting to see the project develop further and continue through its fourth phase under the next chairmanship. A project like this, one would never have been possible without people who believe in it and believe in a making a difference for future generations. I am certain that the discussion here today will be both fruitful and interesting, as you will hear from many of our leading experts in the field. We need to continue to address gender inequality together by calling attention to the issues surrounding it so that we may correct past and existing discrimination in our communities. Thank you. Well, that was very nice. <laughs> Thank you guys for making this work. And, and we send our thanks to the minister for his kind words for the project. This is, this is very inspiring to hear such support. Um, do we now have permission to go on to the panelists, Mike? Okay. Yes, please. Um, I'm gonna start just by kicking off with a, with a, with a question for each of the panelists. Um, I encourage the audience to start sending in their comments and questions um, to the to the email, which I have now forgotten what is, <laughs> but I'm sure we can put it in the chat. Polar at wilson.org, I think. Yeah, it's, it's <clears throat> polar polar at wilsoncenter.org. There you go. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so we have an excellent group of panelists. I'm not going to take up uh, time for introductions. Uh, if people want to put in their introductions, they can do that. But everyone's bio is on the event page. So uh, we don't necessarily have to uh, extensively introduce everyone. So I just want to jump in kind of straight away. And, and Gunhild, where are you, Gunhild? Um, so Gunhild, as one of the lead authors of the chapter on security, you've approached the topic of security in a broader and more com comprehensive sense of the term. Could you explain to us why it is important to look at gender in the Arctic through a human security lens? And could you maybe highlight for us some of the important issues and findings from your chapters? Uh, sure. Uh, and thanks for a good question, Embla. And uh, yeah, as you point out, we, we look at security in a way that, that isn't traditionally, so to speak, um, uh, the, the viewpoint of many, because many people look at it in a very narrow sense, and it's a very sort of militarized sense, it's the use of military to protect the state. What we did was we took a step back and looked historically at the term security and, and what it actually means. And it's not rooted in a state per se as by definition, but it is uh, rooted actually in human beings and our uh, senses of well-being, What that we don't have any fear of things, we're free of worries. So that is at its core, our point in this particular chapter. So what we did was we drew on different theoretical angles uh, because this point I'm making is not new and it's been explored in a variety of ways through uh, human security and more recently looking at comprehensive security and comprehensive understand different security perspectives um, that are accumulating in the same space, so to speak. And that's very relevant to the Arctic. 
Because what we're saying is that our sense of security is very much dependent on what we value, what we prioritize most, and what is meaningful for us, for our lives to continue into the future. Quite often that has to do with our sense of community. This could be a sense of identity uh, through uh, ethnicity, race, nationality, but also is gendered, has to do with orientation, class. So it has all of these different aspects of who we are that, that helps define what we are valuing and, and what we want to prioritize. This is getting into the points that were made in the earlier uh, discussions um, from our uh, presenters on the chapters talking about intersectionality. And, and so we recognize who we are as people in the Arctic and, and how we prioritize, not for the purpose of pitting us against each other that, you know, here are people who, who uh, highlight their identities as Indigenous peoples versus people who highlight their Indigenous uh, identities through other nationality or nationalities or other ethnicities, but actually to take a look at the ways in which uh, we and our relationship to governance, uh, to the law, uh, and to perceptions of security, we have been subjected to different types of discrimination, in fact, and, and how we have been treated differently, you could say under the law, under governments, and, and to make this more open and more visible and find a way that our perceptions of security can be more inclusive and respectful of each other. So that's essentially the, the approach that we're taking. So our focal point in this chapter, or what we highlighted, we highlighted the relationship between this sort of more broadened approach to security and climate change, because we argue that climate change is one of the most important security challenges the Arctic and the globe is facing to today. And, and how climate change is exacerbating some of these uh, discriminations and inequalities that we have experienced over time or and that, that people for, within uh, certain identities experience even more and more. We see some indigenous communities that are extremely um, uh, affected by climate change, for example, in Alaska and communities that are uh, being impacted by um, permafrost disappearing. And, and it also is impacting the fisheries, it's impacting uh, um, traditional economies, it's, it's impacting people uh, across the, the span of the way they understand um, their lives and, and the security around those lifestyles are. So, uh, we're, we're taking a look at that. We're also taking a look at the interconnection of us in the Arctic and the rest of the world, because of course climate change is dependent not just on what we do in the Arctic, but it's very much dependent on how others are, um, are understanding climate change. And so we took a very sort of today's concept and, and discussed the ways in which disinformation and uh, different types of narratives that are uh, against understanding, uh, recognizing the impacts climate change is having on everyday people. Um, but this information actually is quite a, a difficult uh, problem for many of us in the Arctic with regards to climate change. So we looked at that as a, a main point, and then we looked at other issues. We took a look at um, housing issues, uh, which are uh, difficult in some communities across the Arctic, uh, as well as um, violence against particularly women, uh, inequalities in the industry, and also that leads to economic insecurities and, and so forth. So um, that's a very long answer to your question, but uh, it's, a, it's a chapter that could have been a really long one. I know you did a you did a fantastic job synthesizing synthesizing a, a very densely written chapter. So thank you, Gunil. Um, now Bridget. Uh, the Arctic Athabascan Council has been an important and active partner in the project, providing contributions to chapters, as well as invaluable insights and advice, both through the editorial committee engagement through the SWG and the, and the SACEC, um, the chapter feedback session and partner meetings, and you're also co-writer of the introductory chapter. Uh, during all this, we have had very important discussions on different perceptions of gender and terminologies and categories and definitions and the importance of meaningful engagement with indigenous experts during the process. Would you be willing to share your thoughts on, uh, on, on this um, with us today? Sure. 
Sure, and thank you, Embla. And uh, it was an honor and privilege to, to work with you and uh, the entire group and in such a uh, you know, profound, deep diving work that, uh, that this uh, report, report brought about. Um, I'll refer to my notes just um, to make sure I don't uh, forget some of the, the main points, but um, our participation allowed for the sharing of our own worldviews, the spiritual, the physical, the social. Our aspects of, from our lived experiences, our mythologies and philosophies. Our experiences have to be understood and applied to reports such as these and policy so that the story is correct and complete as much as possible. And recommendations are relevant and bring about the change required for a sustainable and thriving quality of life. Our ways of knowing, doing and being has sustained us and keeps us resilient. And the more we are participants and are meaningfully engaged, the more prosperous, I hope we continue to contribute to our existence. A lot more can be said about the contribution. Um, you know, without us sharing our knowledge, um, not only as women, but from, from the gendered lens as, as much as we were able to uh, contribute. Um, I can't put into words, you know, it, it's, it, it was a, like I said, it was an honor to, to work with you, with, with the other contributors, um, you know, feeling that we were being heard, that our words were incorporated into the report and that our knowledge was respected and appreciated. So um, like you said earlier, Embla, hope this doesn't end up on a shelf collecting dust. Hopefully our recommendations that are really meaningful and well thought out and derived from what we, what we heard, what we shared, what we researched, what we read, all of these things, um, you know, have to contribute to the well-being of, of who we are, not only as Indigenous, but as Northerners, as Arctic residents. Um, and, and if we can thrive, so can our land and so can our animals. And we, we all know we're all interconnected. Our stories come from our experiences and our land. So these are real important things. And um, I just hope that this is like a best practice <laughs> um, throughout the rest of the throughout the Arctic Council and its working groups and also our international um, partnership, partnerships and relationships as well. So, you know, thanks again for um, hearing us, listening to us and sharing our words. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Um, thank you as well for sharing with us. And uh, we look forward to, to continue our, our dialogues in the next few years. Where are you? I'm over here. You're the project manager in the DEA project, but also an expert with the Directorate of Equality in Iceland. In your view, why is it important for Iceland to actively engage with issues of gender in an international context? And also, could you share with us briefly what you found to be highlights during the process of developing the report? Yes, big questions. Well, thank you first to everyone uh, in this uh, launch event. Thank you to the uh, to our lead authors for being here, those who are, uh, and thank you to Bridget. One of the things that we can, uh, well, one of the most important reasons for participating in, in projects like this is, is learning, learning and teaching each other. Uh, to kind of see the uh, the differences but not least the commonalities the commonalities that we you know we are a lot of us facing the same problems no matter where we are uh, in the arctic but are uh, 
but the effects may be different uh, depending on where we are, our, our historic background, our ethnic background, indigenous, non-indigenous, uh, etc. And it's very, uh, what I thought was maybe the most interesting thing about the process was exactly listening to Bridget, uh, Carla, Jess and Williamson, who wrote the chapter on, on uh, uh, indigeneity, violence, gender and, and reconciliation, and Norma Shorty in, in some of her meetings where their points of views were coming to, to, a, to a white middle-aged man in Iceland these were revelations. It was so interesting and so much fun to hear, and the and the 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 focus on 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 the narrative, on the stories, on their like Bridget said, the ways of knowing and learning and being. That was a revelation to me, and was so so good and refreshing to hear. Uh, and their approach to uh, to nature and their their. Uh, their identification with the nature and the land around them. It was, it was refreshing to hear. And also the indigenous uh, non-binary history of gender, for example, which I found very interesting, which I knew of, but learned so much more about during the process of this report. And that's something that we can learn in Iceland being a very Western uh, society uh, who were also colonized by Denmark, by the way, we are, we have a, history of being colonized as well as a lot of the indigenous populations in the in the arctic so we we have commonalities there so that these were kind of the interesting things in the process uh, one of the things that iceland has to offer in projects like these uh, is our emphasis and the importance we put on gender equality that does not mean that we uh, have have uniform solutions for everything because we don't but what we do have is this emphasis on gender equality and and the importance of considering it in all aspects of life and maybe that's where we can uh, contribute to to kind of and that's also the the emphasis and the recommendations in the report is for example, mainstreaming gender in, in all decision making and, and the processes so that it's so that we're always considering what effects does this have on on the diff on, on, on different genders on men, women and other genders as well. What 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 does this decision mean? What do these processes mean? Who's affected? How are they affected? These are things that are important for us all to take into consideration. And the the answers to those questions may be different depending on where you are. Just asking the questions and and considering the effects everywhere is what I think is the most important thing. And what we have also learned is uh, what we talk about in the directorate, for example, is that what we really need uh, to achieve gender equality in, in whichever form we we see that to be best is a change in perception and and change in in attitude within our cultures. I think that's one of the most important things that that we need to th rethink things and see them from a different perspective and the indigenous perspective i thought was so interesting and, and so good and refreshing for me in this process does this answer your question at least a little bit it absolutely does thank you <laughs> thank you and actually quite a bit <laughs> uh, <laughs> So now I'm starting to get worried that we're going to run out of time. So um, we already have a couple of questions from the audience, but I really want to try to go through these quickly. Um, so next up, Tonya, the Sami Council has been a very important part, uh, partner in the Gender Project from its inception in 2013. And you contribute to most chapters in the report, um, such as security, environment, migration and mobility, and the violence chapter. Uh, in addition to your valuable contributions in the chapter feedback session, what is the significance of a project on gender from the perspective of the Sami Council and Sami communities? Um, I think that's a that question has several answers, but um, in particular, I think it's important to highlight for the majority society societies that we live in, basically because we are you could say that we are very privileged indigenous people, actually, particularly if you look at our socio socioeconomic 
um, conditions because we are very close up to the majority societies that we live in. We follow them relatively close all along. Um, so if you only look at the official numbers, it would look like we everything is fine or you don't have to do anything or we don't have to have a special focus on Sami uh, gender issues. But we are with our conditions or our issues are still different from the majority society. So and that is not always very clear when you just look at the data. So I think it's very important for us and for the majority society to actually see that there are differences and we need different approaches to solve or to uh, lift up the, the positive sides in our societies. So I think that's very important for us. And then the other side is that I think is very important for ourselves, our, for our community, because it's not this report or reports like this, I don't think they should only be for the majority society, they should also benefit us. And for us, I think it's very important to be reminded that our society also has this complex gender aspect, not just male and female, but also uh, of different types of uh, genders and also people from the LGBTQ plus community. And because as indigenous peoples, we often uh, have, we have a lot of other stuff to, to, to spend our resources on. I've said this before, but I will say it once again, that we have a lot of other issues that are very time sensitive. Like we have an issue, we, we have to stay focused on uh, keeping our language alive, our culture alive. We have to keep a very strong focus on not losing more land because our land is the core of our uh, culture but we are losing land in a hor horrific um, uh, time span it's, so we have a lot of other issues that are we use a lot of resources on these issues and then I think oftentimes the gendered perspectives sort of ends up at the back of the line because we don't have resources we don't have the capacity to be honest to think about everything and we are few people we are i don't know perhaps over just over a hundred thousand or so so like there's not a lot of human resources and capacity and and yeah so i think it's for for our communities or societies it's really it's been good to to see the different aspects and also to highlight things for ourselves and be reminded that we also need to keep a focus on gender issues if not we will end up or will continue to have bad statistics on violence, sexual violence against women that we do have in, in my uh, society. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's the, my main um, points on that. And so, yeah, it's been good for, for both sides, I think, if you could say so. Excellent, thank you, Tonya. Uh, Laurel, there you are. Um, the youth advisory group was an important part of the process and you're part of both the group and also represented the group in the editorial committee. Uh, could you share with us your view on why it is important to include youth in Arctic project work in general and perhaps on a project uh, on gender in so sort of specifically? Good morning, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I think the one of the best things about being like still being considered a youth. Um, I graduated university three years ago. It, I feel like I've done a lot in my short amount of 24 years. Um, however, the nice part about being a youth and being involved and actively sought out for programs like this is that I get to still be inspired and be like, oh, maybe I'll find a master's in this, like in women's and gender studies, you know? And it's just, I think that's the beauty of involving youth um, for one, because we're such a different generation already. Like our generation, which I'm technically a Gen Z, I'm not actually a millennial, which is funny to me, um, is so much more accepting of LGBTQ and other genders and sexual identity. And I think that's so refreshing. Um, but as we go forward, and like like I was saying, the beauty, beautiful part of including youth is that, like, 
we're still like you can still mold us just a little bit even more like in you can still steer us into a great direction to work for you um you know where you're just like oh we have these interests and it's just a matter of like okay now the great thing about like the Arctic Youth Ambassador Program and being reached out for this is that like oh that's out there that's available and that's the beauty of I think the youth being involved and so I'm just very fortunate to be here very inspired um and I'm just excited to see what happens going forward thank you so much thank you Laurel it was a pleasure to work with all uh, you all the, the the lead authors weren't necessarily the most youthy people you'll find but uh, so we definitely what do you mean Andre <laughs> Okay, so I want to ask Friedrich one question and then I want to ask Mike, what happens if we go just a couple of minutes over time? Will, will we be beamed up somehow or what happens? I, I think, I think Embla, our, our friends at the Wilson Center will, will accommodate a few minutes. Okay. Just a couple. They, they, certainly, they certainly will let me know, but that, that's my request of them. I think we're fine. Okay, thank you. So Friedrich, um, you're the Icelandic senior Arctic official. Um, and a part of the Icelandic Arctic Council chairmanship. The project originally was initiated by the Ministry for Foreign Affairs in Iceland and provided great support from its inception. Um, this was also a chairmanship project during this, uh, this chairmanship term. Could you tell me why is greater consideration of gender important in the work of the Arctic Council and its working groups? And what would you recommend as next steps for the project or the council to consider? So very simple question, really. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Ambla. And thank you uh, for putting me right after the youth representative, which uh, sort of highlights my, my, my advancement in years. Um, appreciate that. And but thank you to everyone who has been participating and contributing to this project. I have a very simple answer to your question, actually, um, because the work isn't done. I think uh, what you've illustrated here today as you've done your reporting and your presentation is that, you know, we're nowhere near the end of the road in terms of what needs to be done uh, on, on the gender, gender front. Uh, we need to, uh, you know, work on how do we turn your lessons identified into real lessons learned and applied. Um, you know, how, how, how will this, all the work you've done, how will this impact policy and law where, you know, when needed, where, where needed and appropriate? How do we follow up on the gaps you've identified, the additional gaps you've identified, the new questions that you raise? How do we continue closing all these gaps, ensure that uh, you know, continued mainstreaming? How do we drive empowerment? How do we encourage uh, again uh, and continue to encourage participation and inclusion? How do we ensure continued protection, increased protection? And the Arctic Council as principally a knowledge forum of international cooperation needs to be at the center of this. We need to continue talking, we need to continue listening, we need to continue to do analysis, and then we continue to do recommendation, and then we continue to implement. And this is a virtuous uh, cycle that we need to continue to keep going, talk, listen, analyze, recommend, implement, talk, listen, et, et cetera. So it's a continued work in progress. So again, as I thank all of you for your work and your uh, contributions, uh, uh, you know, great work. Now we just need to keep on working uh, and continue because again, the work isn't done. I thought it was interesting, for example, in your lessons identified that or lessons learned was that, hey, we need to be more inclusive. I mean, who would have thought that the, uh, you know, when you're working on gender, which is all about inclus inclusivity, that one of your lessons in 2021 is that you need to be more inclusive because you didn't, hadn't considered youth and indigenous people per, uh, uh, sufficiently when you started out with this process. Now, uh, also on term uh, terms of resources and funding requirements, yes. And this is where you need to keep us, the, uh, you know, the policy end of things, uh, uh, like the SAOs, you need to keep really keep our feet to the fire. It's one thing to make lofty proclamations in meetings and say we need to do this, that, or the other. If the funding and commitment doesn't follow with it, then these are just empty words. So that's something that we need to keep uh, keep working on. Um, and then in terms of uh, the resources, time. Yes, we need more time. We need to uh, you know start early, continue the work. And then I, I'll also lift the, uh, lift the ever important issue of data. Uh, if if uh, my minister mentioned this as well, if we, if we don't have proper data, we 
we don't we can't do proper analysis and then we can't do the proper implementation etc cetera, etc cetera. and keep in mind even and i i don't want to uh, um be seen as uh, contradicting my uh, my boss the minister but even he brought up, you know, Iceland has been doing really, really well on the uh, uh, on the uh, uh, on the on the gender uh, on the gender front in terms of equality. But believe me, there is so much work left to be done. Uh, and as we saw in the, for example, in your economic data in, uh, and in terms of the balances, increased women in education, increased presence of women in education, and then the the adverse impact uh, increased female education then has on the industries or the work uh, environment that they enter into. How is it that in this day and age, if more women enter into a particular field to work, that negatively impacts the uh, the the uh, the mean mean and medium salaries in that industry or that field to work? Are we happy with that? I would not think so. So that's something that we need to need to need to do something about. Uh, so again. I come back to my first point. Why should you know? Why should we? Uh, uh, why should we continue? What, what's the focus again? Because the worst work isn't done. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Friedrich. Um, now we have a couple of questions from the audience, and I want to uh, give uh, at least one of them a chance um, because it's a very important one. Well, they're all important. So there's a question here. Were two-spirit or gender non-binary experiences perspectives accounted for in anyone's research? If so, how? Were there any policy relevant highlights associated with these experiences? I'm not entirely sure who is best equipped to answer that question. Uh, I do think that all of the chapters addressed it to some extent. Does anybody want to jump in or should I just, uh, Kirsty? Yeah. I, I, from my point of view, we tried, I think most of the chapters tried, all of them, but it then boils down to what we've discussed repeatedly here, the lack of, of data and statistics uh, and lack of research. There was really not very much to go on. And also, like you mentioned earlier, Embla, the, the scope uh, and the 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 very, very snug timeline we had meant that we had to kind of narrow down our focus a little bit. And my point of view has been, and we may see where this goes in the future with the GA project, is that this is something that needs its own focus. It is a huge topic uh, and it's something that needs discussion and it needs uh, to be addressed. We need data, we need statistics, we need analysis, we need to look into this properly. And although it would have been good to do that a little bit in this report, I think it needs more focus and, and, and more effort to be put into that specifically. But yeah, we, it was, you know, the, the violence chapter for Carla looked at it, wrote about this a bit then. And yeah, so this is kind of my very thin answer to that. Yeah, I think you're right. Carla was, uh, she's the one who, who um dug the deepest. So um, you should definitely uh, read the chapter on violence, indigeneity, gender and um, reconciliation. But Gunil, do you wanted to add something quickly? Yeah, just to um, to say that uh, we were really fortunate that uh, we could get some input from a colleague of ours who identifies as, as two-spirited. They are also practitioners. They're on on the ground, so to speak, they're in their own community and and working with other people who are two spirited because it's it's not just a question of acceptance, even in the indigenous communities where they themselves uh, come from. So uh, we were really lucky to get some insights from them. Um, uh, they the difficulty was uh, having that data that uh, Sjalti also is is talking about. So this obviously is is a um, an issue area and that they actually had the time to to be able to to even give us the insights that that they did so uh i just wanted to sort of like uh pay up on the idea that we get more in depth on this because this is a huge gap in uh, in knowledge but that we also have had some really fantastic uh insights from from the people who have contributed and um and those were very important and and need acknowledgement. So I just want to do that. So thank you to Kyle. 
Um, does anyone else want to chime in here or, or should I move on to, uh, there's another question that I would like to get out there because it is has to do with data. Um, it seems to me that the identified need for disaggregated data applies across all the themes in today's presentations. Can representatives from each topic speak to this need in their respective areas and how we might do this going forward to inform research? So just if you guys have any sort of concrete uh, thoughts to share, it would be great to, uh, to jump in here. No? Andre, come on. <laughs> yeah, no, I just could say that, um, you know, uh, it's, it's true that, uh, you know, the, the ways of collecting and uh, representing data should be um, uh, done across the board in terms of the, uh, looking at different genders. I think this, I mean, there is a, a lot of different um, indicators and, and, and uh, variables we could use. I think what we uh, were thinking, and I think we suggested in the paper, in, in, the, in the report, is to work with uh, various agencies and across the Arctic Council to bring together a kind of working group that would look into that and uh, join resources that those agencies have in their jurisdictions to actually try to channelize some of this data. And part of this data could go to developing the, uh, for example, Arctic Gender Equality Index, uh, but also for other purposes. But we really need uh, the buy-in from those um, agencies and from those jurisdictions that could look and provide some of this data. So it's never going to be complete. It's, uh, I'm sure it will be a long process, but I think that if we start it now, we will be there better and quicker than if we started later. So that's, I guess, our recommendation. Uh, I think Gosia was first and then Bridget. Thank you. Um, I guess to, to follow up from what Andre said, I mean, definitely when it comes to collection of data, um, it seems that Arctic Council could be really an excellent body to, to spearhead work, work on this. Because one of the things that we have seen is not only a lack of data, but we think it's also very important that we actually um, stay open-minded and uh, get creative with understanding what kind of data we need. And here I would like to use just a few examples. For instance, consistently, when it, when it comes to fisheries, one of the issues is that, for instance, in Alaska, we do have data that is sex disaggregated. The point is, however, that the data what we are collecting on catch owners of boats, et cetera, it typically shows that those are primarily men who are involved in this sector because the sector that the part of industry where women are involved with, this is actually a shore crew. So kind of instances where we do not collect this data, meaning we are, we are making women invisible in this sector. So it's not only a question that we, um, start collecting data, but that we improve it and we actually do understand better what is happening in the, on the ground. Same thing when it comes to forestry. For instance, the research being done in Finland and, and in some other Nordic countries pointed out that women forest owners um, who engage in forestry business, they are actually much more interested in more holistic approaches that account for economic, not only for economic, but also recreational, spiritual values, et cetera, meaning they're interested in new sectors for development that we should be accounting for. Because one thing is, of course, as we are looking now at the transition in in the region, it is it is important that um, we account for those changes and that once again, that the data that we should be collecting follows those developments and helps us understand what is happening much better. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both. Uh, Bridget? Yeah, not to add much to what was said, but I think it comes down to the state's political will, uh, your, your population, um, uh, I guess defines the budget. So here again, you know, you have the three territories in Canada that uh, mere population of 100,000 people, um, you know, majority indigenous. So, you know, how do we, um, how do our needs inform uh, the budget? Um, clearly we only get a, a, a small percentage. So resources are, are, um, are thin, but, uh, there it comes down to uh, if a state is really serious about quality of life, then they have to know what the issues are, and that, that that you can only collect that through statistics or you know hearing from the people. Yeah, exactly. Um, I know there's also, for instance, in the Nordic countries, we had issues with uh, finding uh, 
ethnicity disaggregated data. I'm going to tell, say this in the wrong way, which I guess, uh, I mean, Tonya could speak to this, but I guess it's sort of, uh, do you want to, Tonya? Sure. Um, that's a particular issue for, for the Sami uh, people. In, in, on, in Russia, they do collect data on, on ethnic minority groups and indigenous peoples. Uh, but the Sami population in Russia is very small. It's only officially, um, I think it's 1500 people or so individuals. So the majority of the Sami uh, people do not live in Russia and, and in Norway, Sweden and Finland, they, we are not allowed to collect data on ethnicity. And that's a really, that's a big issue um, because we don't know if the policies that the governments are pushing out how we don't know how they are affecting us actually we don't have data on that we don't know if the the um, the um, sort of policies or the um, the uh, it's probably not called policies what the sami parliaments are doing because they're not a they only um advisory organ but still like the the sami parliaments do um do work with their budget. So we don't know if the budget work that they're doing in our Sami communities are actually doing, are improving the quality of life in Sami communities. Mm -hmm. And we that's also uh, an issue with, we have actually not had proper data and people have not been aware until 2017 that Sami women uh, are, um, uh, are experiencing violence in a much higher degree than majority of women in Norway do because of the lack of uh, data on ethnicity. So uh, actually even people, Sami people were surprised by this finding. And when we don't, we don't even know, or we, the, there's not the conscious mind around, around this, or at least before it wasn't account, we weren't conscious about this. So if we don't even know that the problem exist how are we going to fix it and now that we know that the problem exists but how can we know that the that the policies that are or the measures that are put out there are actually working for sami women or and are improving our living conditions so it's a very problematic issue for us in 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 many aspects but still there are um Within the Sami community, there are voices that are critical on the thought of even collecting ethnic ethnic data. So, and we have this whole, we have now on the Norwegian side, we have this discussion on who are, if we're gonna do data on ethnicity and on some people, who are gonna do the collection, who's gonna own the data um, and who is gonna have, yeah, the authority and, and to do so. And the whole issue of who is to be counted as Sami or not. So it's a very complex mm -hmm. topic, but mm, I personally hope that someday we will be able to collect so that we do not have to have new surprises of violence <laughs> that we got for just yeah. a few years ago. So yeah. Yeah, as, um, as Friedrich and others have pointed out, the work is just beginning. Uh, I think I'm seriously pushing my luck in terms of time now, right? So where's Jennifer's fence? Jennifer? You're gonna you're gonna provide us with summary and closing remarks. Well, I I don't I won't pretend to try to attempt to uh, draw together. I mean, it's been a incredibly rich discussion, which is so reflective of what this group has done. So I'll, I'll do the champion uh, speech at the end, and and that is to really emphasize. I mean, I'm gonna steal the words of others when I say this. Um, uh, I, I I would I would come back to Friedrich's point that the work's not done. So what uh, the Gender Equality in the Arctic Project offers the Sustainable Development Working Group and the Arctic Council is, is two amazing things. One is this excellent uh, report, uh, which uh, is part of an ongoing conversation. So it, it, it really is, uh, it comes from the work that was done before it. Um, and this work, it also becomes a huge foundation to, to do more work. 
So it's an amazing product uh, that I know that we will be learning from. Um, and I really look forward to being part of those conversations uh, about how we can continue to learn from the report. I think I also have to really emphasize, and I think it's come across so clearly in this session, um, that about how the project has been done um, is, you know, the, the, the point that Hirti made about learning and teaching each other. It's been, uh, it's, it's so clear in the way that this group has worked together and really thoughtfully worked on this initiative that it really is a model for how SDWG can do projects and, and advance an agenda. Um, so, I mean, it, it, I, I don't think I'm being unfair to say that the GIA project is a flagship of this and uh, the commitment of the SDWG continues um, and the discussions about where we go from here and how we build phase four. I'm so happy uh, that it's just a given uh, that uh, GIA will be a part of the SDWG family um, and that there's more work to do. And I, uh, so I won't belabor the point, but congratulations to you all for your amazing work on this. Uh, and it's been a real, real pleasure working with all of you uh, to see this be successful. And I really look forward to continuing uh, to advance this work uh, moving forward. So thank you. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Um, the good thing you didn't keep going. You're gonna, you're gonna make us weep. <laughs> thank you. Um, I think we have to probably call it a day. I just want to thank all of you for being here with us today. Uh, we've all gone through a, a pretty hectic few months uh, in, in pulling this together. Um, thank all of you and everyone that's been involved with this project. And you guys, Mike and the Wilson Center and Polar Institute, thank you for all the organization and keeping things together. Um, and we will see you at the next uh, GEA4 preparation meeting. So thank you.